Hey, Sandra, how are you? Hi, hi, Marcus. I'm good. How are you? Good to see you again. I'm good. Yeah. So um, welcome to today's Screen Time Live interview as part of Virtual Design Festival sponsored by Philips TV and Sound. And you are, I've been practicing the pronunciation of your name, Sandra von der Eyck. That's completely correct. Thank you for that. Taking the effort to pronounce it like that. <laughs> she's one of the hardest ones I've, I've done in this whole series. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Sandra. Uh, yeah, so I'm an artist and designer. Um, and I do a lot of other things as well, uh, which are all in line with my practice. Uh, as an artist and designer, I focus on art or design and ecology and activism. Um, I'm leading a master's program called Ecology Futures. It's brand new. We've started up last year and um, we're starting our full first course in September. So it's very exciting. Um, I'm also an affiliated researcher in the Research Center for Bio-Based Art and Design that's uh, uh, linked to, to, the, to the master's. And I'm starting my PhD in Belfast in September as well. So it's uh, exciting times for me. In Belfast? In Belfast, yes, yes. What is your PhD going to be in? Uh, it's going to be uh, about art in the geographical context. Uh, so it's uh, going to um, focus, basically it's a practice lab PhD. So that means that my uh, analyzing my practice and my works and how they link uh, to this topic of art in the geographic context. Um, and then, uh, yeah, of course, I still have to find my focus in that, but that's what that PhD is all about. So I'm quite curious what will happen. <laughs> and where are you today? Where are you calling in from? I'm at, I'm, at, I'm at home. I just, I haven't been in the studio at all since the whole uh, COVID-19 crisis happened. Um, we're in a building with uh, 40, 50 people, so that's quite a lot. Um, so I decided to just work from home and I had to move the educational program online as well. So I had to do so much computer work, so much um, video calls online. So it was just very convenient to be here. And But your home is where? Which where uh, you... It's in, oh yeah, sorry, of course. It's in Utrecht, the Netherlands. I'm in the Netherlands. And how are things in the Netherlands now? Are they getting back to normal? Yeah, it's it's pretty okay here, I must say. I mean, uh, people are out and about. Of course, there's some criticism about that. People who are thinking that's not a good idea. But in general, I'm very happy that I can just go get my coffee somewhere and even sit at a terrace and feel like uh, I'm a normal person. <laughs> um, and I mean, I see that the cases are declining here. So I think overall we're good. The borders are reopened again uh, to the majority of the countries in Europe. So I guess, um, yeah, we all have to wait and see how that goes. That's a bit exciting. And especially yeah, taking into account that there might be a second wave of some kind. So we don't know what will happen in September or October when the cold weather returns. But for now, um, yeah, life's pretty good here. It's, uh, good. it's well manageable. And we worked together a couple of years ago. Um, we worked on a, a great project. We did a talk together at Dutch Design Week about the Anthropocene era, um, which is a kind of a big theme of, of your work. Um, but just, just tell everyone a little bit about the talk that we did, the, the thing we organized together in Eindhoven. Yeah, so I already told you, like, I do many things. So uh, back then I was freelancing for the Dutch Design Foundation. And um, as a... Um, uh, as a programmer, so one of my tasks was to come up with a theme for uh, for the design talk. Or no, actually, you came up with a theme. I had to come up with the program. So um, I gave you some input on on the topic of the Anthropocene and things that I was reading back then. I remember this very bold email that I was sending uh, about that we actually shouldn't title it Anthropocene <laughs> already back then. Uh, that's been a continued topic in my work. I'll get back to that see, to that later, to that term, using the Anthropocene as a term. Um, but then uh, I, of course, found these speakers uh, that um, were on the panel, uh, which were Jalila Asaidi, uh, Short, um, oh, I have to, I'm so bad at names, I'm gonna, people are gonna shoot me in the head now. Maybe you can help me. You also know who the speakers were. <laughs> I remember there was a, there was a, um, uh, an anthropologist who had a very difficult name to yeah, that's true. And um, uh, yeah, there was a Perio Haikola. I also hope I pronounced her name right. She was an architect. Uh, and I mean, they, they all gave their perspective on, on the Anthropocene from very different point of views. And it was nice to have a scientist, uh, scientist there as well. Yeah, geologist Stuart Cleaving and yeah, uh, Messina. And, um, and of course, the, uh, the, the Anthropocene is the, the proposed name for the new geological era that we're entering, whereby the human activity is having 
as big an impact or a bigger impact on the planet as geology itself and and all of the other natural forces and yes you didn't think we should call it a, the talk about the anthropocene um because you felt that people already knew about that and i was like i don't think they do <laughs> and, oh, you were completely right about that by the way yeah and and um the the point of the talk was to to see to discuss how design can can um, respond to the fact that we're in this new era of planetary change caused by human activity, uh, whether there's anything we can do about it to slow it down or whether we should just embrace it in a way and, and accept it. And, and the, the, the headline of the story we ran about it was a headline from Khalila, which was about, we need more science fiction. We need to, designers need to help us dream big to fix the problems of the world. Um, I, had, I did a talk with Winnie Mast the other day and he was kind of saying the same thing. He said, we almost need to think on a planetary scale and, and design a new planet for ourselves or design alternative planets yes. so that we can envision what needs to be done to, to change things. Sorry, I've taken over the talk a little bit. No, no, I mean, I completely agree. That's why I'm so silent. I just don't have anything to argue with. So. <laughs> well, anyway, that's enough from me. How about you send a, show us your presentation now and talk about your work a bit? All right, okay, that's a good idea. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, um, yes, this is a picture of an area specific to the Netherlands. It's called the Oosterschelde, uh, or Eastern Scheldt in, in, um, in English. Sandra, Sandra. Yeah. yeah. Can I see it yet? You cannot see it yet? No. Oh, wait. Again. Okay, I'll try again. That was awkward. Um, let me see. Do you see it now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't know what, what okay, and, um, and go into presentation mode? Yeah, I'm going there now. Yeah, okay, so that must make a lot more sense now. Uh, can you see the full screen? No, it's still not full screen. No, oh, it's full screen with me. To play the presentation. I'll just do it again. How about now? No, it's weird. I can still see the whole application. Okay, it maybe... before, didn't it when we did the test? Yeah, it, it went fine. It's always these stupid technical things that happen when you don't want to. Um, maybe we should just go ahead with it like this because we can at least see the pictures. They're just not full screen. Mm, yes. Um, maybe I'll just try and share my screen one more time. Is it okay? There you are. The screen sharing was working. The problem was that we could see the desktop rather than the whole image. Yeah, no, I get it. You click pl play, it would be in English, it would be play. Yeah, I'm doing that. How about now? There we are. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, I just, it's a fair, it was just a technical glitch, I guess. Uh, I was doing the same thing for 10 times. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, this is the, the area that I wanted to share a little bit about. It's called uh, the Oosterschelde in Dutch and the Eastern Schelde in, in English. And it's in the south of the Netherlands. And um, yeah, I basically fell in love with this landscape uh, because uh, it's completely, it's a, it's a cultural landscape. It didn't exist before, it's completely man-made. And uh, it's very famous because it holds the storm surge barriers that the Netherlands is so famous for. So basically it keeps us dry. Um, but because we installed these dams, uh, there was a completely, a whole new ecology arose. Uh, and this led to this landscape, uh, so it's completely cultivated. Uh, but at the same time, it provided this environment for all these different organisms uh, to thrive. Um, and at the same time, you know, all these problems came with that as well. So uh, we can, with the dams, we can control the tides uh, and the amount of water that comes in. And it creates this very special calm water in which a lot of things can grow. But there's also a very important shipping route that goes right through it. So that means that everything that these ships bring along uh, also stays behind in these waters. And if they like the environment, they thrive as well. So you get these, uh, you know, uh, you get a competitiveness between the native species and the, the species that are, that, have, that are coming from all over the world with the ships. And I think this is, you know, this, this landscape I've been returning in my work uh, several times uh, here. The first time that I did a project about this place was with Nico Hoogvliet. Uh, together we developed these um, uh, uh, textile dyes from, from seaweed. Because seaweed is one of the things that, that can grow exceptionally well here. 
And it basically stemmed from a very uh, practical approach of mine saying, okay, we need seaweed, where can we get seaweed? And I ended up in this landscape and I just completely fell in love with it and uh, with all its complexity. So after we did this project, which was um, uh, kind of trying to find a design answer to uh, how toxic the, the dyeing industry and the textile industry was, um, I became so interested in all these complexities about our behaviors and the structures and the, you know, um, how this is all encompassed in this in this one landscape. So I decided to to, uh, to develop something new from it. Um, there will always be some in my in my presentations or in my works. There's always like this this clash between is it art or design. So I won't address that here, but. Um, I'm just saying that it's always coming from a design approach, but this was an artwork that I did based on that, um, on that notion that uh, this estuary, which it was, uh, brought together this strange um, uh, interactions of materials and organisms. And what I did here is basically try to remake that landscape. Um, what you see here are four of these, um, um, these containers. Um, that are basically human-made ecosystems. So there's an invasive species of seaweed in each of those containers, a different one. And um, they are filled up in uh, salt and sweet water um, or regular water, I don't know, fresh water, sorry, that's in English. And um, yeah, through this, because I forced them into the system, which basically Oosterschelde also is, uh, you get this uh, complete cycle of life and death. So what happens is that the, the seaweeds first deteriorate and they release their pigments into the water. And then next, there's loads of life in that water that kind of thrives on the nutrients that come from that seaweed. And this again produces whole colonies of organisms that would usually be, uh, not. you won't be able to see them with the naked eye because they, and now they grow in such quantities that they show their color. And uh, so this is a process that uh, evolves over time, about um, three weeks. And through these three weeks, you see them turning from uh, blank to slowly releasing uh, pink and reddish pigments. So at the height, you can see here these fluorescent colors. And then they change the green, even blue, uh, gray, even black. And then eventually everything turns blank and it dies. And um, yeah, that, that's actually, uh, I mean, it's a bit depressing, but um, yeah, maybe that's a peek into the future of what will happen in our landscapes, in our man-made landscapes. It's actually happening already there now because the algae blooms are so intense that uh, they, they kind of suck up or they use up all the, the oxygen in the, in the water. Uh, so many things cannot live there anymore. Um, so from that, you know, process uh, is a very important theme in my work. I don't know if I'm able to show that in these 10, ten slides because you know, sometimes you, you, in my work, I usually need multiple pictures to show how things change over time. Time and, you know, um, it's, it's a really big topic for me, how things change over time, like short, time, short term things, but also extremely long geological timelines um, and how they relate to our time uh, on Earth here as a human being. So our human lifetime. And um, so this the first project that I just showed you now uh, used material direct from the landscape and um, now, I, this was actually the point in my work where the Anthropocene became a very um, widespread notion, uh, especially in the art world. And um, I responded to that with this project and it's called Future Remnants. And it, it departed from the notion that, you know, we are, we are responsible for large scale redistribution of materials in all kinds of different ways. We cause materials to interact with each other and these materials would normally never uh, even have the opportunity to interact with each other. And um, it departed also from a scientific art article that explained that there were 208 new minerals found or acknowledged. And previously they couldn't be acknowledged because uh, there was no category for them. There was only a natural and a synthetic mineral, but something in between like this hybrid thing that didn't exist. And um, all these 200 plus uh, minerals, these were actually um, uh, this hybrid that originated uh, clearly from a situation that was man-made, but they happen through a natural process. And I thought that was fascinating and a, you know, very speculative idea about, you know, how our future world could look like or our future landscape. Maybe, you know, we will divert from, from this human perspective and place ourselves in the, in the, in the, in the shoes of the minerals. And, you know, we will create this fantastic world with all these crazy minerals 
that reminds me of this Jules Verne movie where they had these beautiful movie sets with all these crystals and things. And I thought maybe the future isn't so bad, you know? Uh, so I thought, you know, how can I communicate this to the, to the broader public? And I think, uh, you know, I thought, let's just keep it very, very simple, a very simple experiment and see what arises from that. So I went to the, to the, um, uh, to the, um, uh, to the building markets. Um, so where you get your building materials, um, the hardware store. And um, I basically got all these basic um, chemicals that we use in and around our house every day. Um, and I thought, you know, let's see how those minerals or, or sorry, how those um, chemicals interact with uh, everyday building materials that we have used at a in a very large scale in our environment. And eventually I, I scaled that down to just metals because the amount of reactions that I was getting was enormous. So this is a selection of my samples, all the different material reactions. And I think this is just one, one third of, of it. And I learned to control those reactions and translated them onto all these different objects and placed them together. This was with Dutch and Virtuals, the show Mutant Matter at the Milan Design Week of 2017. And I really use this as like a, a speculative landscape, design landscape of, of material reactions and new crystallizations. And to have this discussion with people about, you know, what if our landscape would look like this? You know, is it a bad thing actually? You know, how do, how do we relate to this? Uh, can we actually control it or do we want to control it? And uh, here you can see two close-ups um, where you can actually see that new crystallizations did happen. So it was a, you know, the experiments uh, led to a variety of either a type of patina that would change like the pattern or the surface structure, but actually it also created loads of new actual minerals uh, that were growing on those surfaces and have been growing in my studio ever since because I'm horrible at cleaning up my experiments. And in this time, in this term, that actually paid off uh, really well because um, yeah, I constantly run into new crazy crystallizations in my studio. And then the third project I wanted to share with you is, uh, so I'm trying to share all these different perspectives of how I, how I tackle these huge topics. And uh, obviously, you know, the notion of the Anthropocene came, but then also the realization of you know, the actual effects of climate change really started to become visible uh, in 2018. Um, or, of course, to already long before that, but it started to, you know, really become so apparent also in our Western society um, that I felt that that was something that I had to do with it. And it departed again from a project for Dutch and Virtuals. And their initial theme was reduce. And uh, basically everybody was asked to, you know, to develop a work based on the theme reduce. Um, and my only thought that I had was, you know, reduce, yes, but how, not, not necessarily how can we reduce, you know, the amount of stuff around us or, or, or not necessarily that solution minded thinking, but I was thinking, you know, how the world will, will reduce itself and um, how many things will be lost. And um, yeah, so I decided to take like the, the, the forefront of climate change in terms of visual culture is, of course, uh, glaciers and glacier structures. So I went on a trip uh, to visit one glacier to actually have this direct interaction with a glacier because I thought to myself, you know, I don't even know what a glacier is. And before I know what it is, um, had this physical uh, experience with this glacier, um, it will already be gone. And um, so maybe it's time, you know, to, to confront myself with that landscape and also with the grief over losing something that might not be there in the future. And I was thinking about how our cultural identity intertwines with this landscape. So how I can feel horrible if something in that landscape changes because I built my identity on that landscape in which I live. And, um, and so I took all those um, uh, technologies with me that contribute to climate change, uh, consumer electronics. So two laptops, a 3D scanner, a tablet, and a, and a phone with a 4G signal. And I, I had a, and a way, I was very lucky to, to be able to uh, climb to the foot of this glacier in Switzerland and have that 4G signal so I could connect all my equipment to the internet. And there I got my up close interaction with the glacier. So the rocky thing that you see behind uh, is the glacier covered in rubble and I was connecting here all my devices. And I started scanning all the surface structures, all the different types of surface structures of this glacier, just to get a sense of identity of the glacier. And these are three of them. Uh, I eventually back home, so I brought back all these different scans. 
Uh, and together with the uh, proto, proto space at Utrecht University, I was able to translate these scans back into reality, into a model of um, that's the start of an archive of glacier structures. So these are three different ones that you see here. And this was the presentation at, uh, at Dutch and Virtuals again, uh, mostly aimed towards you know having this conversation with people. Do you experience any emotions in losing this landscape, losing? All these organisms to to uh, to climate change to animals uh, plants everything that's ex uh, going extinct basically and you know can we unite perhaps in that feeling in those uh, in that acknowledgement of those emotions because i think it's actually a very powerful tool um yeah and i've ever since i've been researching that topic how our cultural identity is intertwined with the landscape um, and also uh, this notion of ecological grief um, you know, how our psycho psychological uh, experience of climate change can contribute to making images, but also uh, having conversations and coming into actions to uh, collectively change something. So that was my presentation for now. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. So uh, the first question I wanted to, to ask you, which probably you get asked all the time, is that you call yourself uh, a designer or we're calling you a designer. Yet there's no um, there's no object at the end of it. There's no sort of functional object. So, how would you describe uh, your relationship with the whole notion of design? Is it is it you follow a design process, or you just happen to go to design school, or you're nothing to do with design at all? <laughs> um, yeah, people don't really know what to do with me, and it's like I'm not an artist, but I'm also not a designer. I'm just something hybrid, I guess. Um, I mean, I do notice that I really follow a design process, uh, so a design thinking process. Um, and also I have my background is in graphic design and then I did a master's in art science. And I noticed that um, this background in graphic design always makes me think about how things communicate to the public. Uh, so in that, in that way, I am actually really a designer. But um, my practice is very rhizomatic, you know, it's everything is entangled and one, you know, um, research leads to another, topics uh, entangle, um, outcomes are temporary, so I don't know, it's just not very outcome based in a sense, and um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe a little bit about those 208 minimal those 208 minerals that nobody could categorize so they didn't bother to categorize them you sit between art and design and and science research yes um but um you you mentioned about um climate grief and you said that uh, i built my we build our identity on the, the landscapes that we're living in um does, does that mean that sort of uh grief human grief is because of the the, the, the way it changes your perception of yourself like you're losing something i never really thought of it like that is that yeah i think we're yeah. all with the idea of climate grief which is that we see the world changing and we know that it's going to be disastrous and we feel terrible about it but i didn't realize it was a self-centered emotion in a way i for me that's that's the core of it because um and i i've noticed also you know in our western societies we'll we will be the last uh, severely impacted place because we have a lot of money and you know we will organize ourselves in a way that we won't be impacted that much even though it will come at a cost of thousands of other people it's just like the mentality of the west right uh, but if you look at a, at a, at a for instance an example of, of the inuit um, they are already at the forefront of climate change because they live where the ice is melting and uh, part of their cultural identity is for instance how they use um uh, sleds or ha even furthermore like uh, uh, inter um, uh, more than human relationships they they use dogs to to pull those sleds and um yeah a very simple example is that they just they haven't been able to do that anymore because now they have to use boats and this like profound thing this they did this for for centuries you know their ancestors did this this is their way of life and basically just because the ice melted, that wasn't possible anymore. So their cultural identity is really, uh, they have to reinvent their cultural identity or that part of their identity. And they're grieving over losing that relationship with the landscape, but also with their dogs and perhaps even with their stuff, you know, with their sleds, which are um, made in a specific way, according to tradition. And so for you, what is the, the sorry, this, might, this doesn't mean, doesn't 
it doesn't mean to come across as rude as it sounds, but what is the purpose of your work? What's the point in it? Is it is it to explain things to people? Is it to provoke people? Is it to record that these things are happening? What what is it for? It's to um, acknowledge the fact that all these matter that I. Okay, so it's to and basically it's to untangle the complexities around art and design, uh, around the um, environmental degradation and climate change through art and design. That's 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 my goal, and the reason why I find it important is because loads of uh, art and design projects uh, start to deal with this topic now, uh, but they don't take into account uh, the complete like interconnectedness of all these topics. So it's usually you know. I don't like the problem solving mentality of the Dutch anymore that much because I've learned through, you know, studying and through, um, yeah, through my research practice, basically, that all these solutions have many consequences that lead to uh, loads of other problems. And I think, you know, acknowledging that is a first step and trying to untangle that is something else. And I think art and design is absolutely vital in that process. That is a great, a great statement. I don't like the problem solving mentality. <laughs> uh, we've, we've a lot of people in the UK have always admired the Dutch and, you know, it's a cliche that you built the dikes to keep the water back, you built the landscape and so on and so forth. But does that mean that you have a, a worldview that says we should do nothing about this? Or do you have a, like a, what is, what is your view on the whole situation that it's a disaster, but we just should let it unfold or we should aspire to solving it or or travel back in time <laughs> what, what happened what what do you have a proposal is even is it even your job to have a proposal no i don't think so uh i think it's just um my well i mean what i would really like is if we can start and that's i i that we come back to the start of the talk a bit is that we can think of these alternative realities uh, so, you know, we're so stuck in this whole system where we, where we, you know, the, the bandwidth of thinking, how can we do this differently is, is thinking, okay, here's capitalism, now use it for windmills or for, you know, uh, and that's the kind of problem solving mentality that I'm talking about. So it's not that I'm against solving problems because I'm still very hopeful that we can, uh, and that we can collectively also do so. So it's not that I'm against doing something. It's more that, you know, um, I do find it, imp I would be the, the annoying professor saying, you know, just take a wider look before you take any of those decisions and, you know, be respectful towards all these other visions that are already present because we can speak as white people about, you know, not for, for instance, um, if you talk about an alternative reality, maybe not envisioning uh, things going from point A to point Z, but seeing them as a circular thing, that would be a very mind changing thing for Western people. Uh, so not to have like a problem and a solution, you know, uh, but to have something that, you know, the, the kind of um, is much more uh, entangled in a way. And respect also that entangledness of you, if you get my drift. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and also the problems are so complex. I mean, we've been writing a lot on the zine about plastic and recycling and protecting the oceans and so on and so forth but it seems where the harder you look to come up with a kind of comprehensive solution the harder it gets to do that because yeah. um what are we going to use instead of plastic and what about the plastic that's already in the ocean it is there's there's no there's no recycling is just not any kind of solution so no uh, no, exactly. So you need drastic measure, measures, I guess. And that's where, uh, you know, this envisioning alternative realities is extremely important. Um, I've been working a lot with biological materials in my work, and I still really like that because, you know, all these or the microorganisms, they all have their own uh, world and their way that they went through evolution and their whole uh, system of living together and living in symbiosis with other uh, organisms. So studying these worlds might actually also provide uh, like... Um, drastic, alter like extreme alternatives to the way that we build our society or organize our economics or our politics or our decision-making processes. And I think that's very necessary to, to, you know, this is the age where we can come up with all the crazy ideas because we need crazy ideas to solve the crazy problems. But what are the crazy ideas then? Because you said before you were optimistic that we can come up with solutions. Um, what would, 
what would your solution be? I know it's a stupid question, there yeah. is a solution, but <laughs> no, how, yeah. maybe, maybe I've rephrased the question, how can you make yourself part of the solution rather than part of identifying the problems? Yeah, well, I don't know if I want to be part of the solution necessarily in the sense that I just have a really big problem with still putting things in the in like solution or or problem you know that's that's the whole way of thinking that i'm i'm trying to kind of oppose i guess um so yeah what i mean i think for me it's just where i would go is try and try out different things so and because i think if you I don't know, these large scale, you could see, I'm going to try and be very careful about what I say now because I don't want to sound like an eco-fascist, but if you can, if you see what COVID-19 did now with our society and how that's actually led to a huge range of forced experiments, then you can, then you see, you know, that things can change or that things can also be done in a different way uh, that might actually not stand in the way of, you know, having, leading our lives or enjoying our comforts. And I'm still talking from a very Western perspective, of course, being now on a live chat with you instead of doing it somewhere live where I probably had to fly into. So that's, you know, trying, thinking up these alternatives and having an open mind to that. And, and you know, doing that together with a lot of people in which a lot of worldviews are respected. I think that's the way forward. And I mean, it's not an easy answer and it's not maybe a solution, but it's a, it's a way forward. And I think, Maybe that's what I'm looking for as a way forward, like day by day and not necessarily like, okay, let's now clean up the whole ocean from plastics because it's just naive, you know, it's, it's not a, the, any solutions that come from that kind of thinking will always be, uh, fall short, I believe, in the end of, solu of finding that ultimate solution. You know, it's not looking for the answer. It's very cliche maybe to say this, but not looking for the answer, but, you know, forcing, uh, forcing the attention to the road that leads to somewhere. Yeah. It says on your website that you reinterpret the landscape from an anti-anthropological point of view. What does that what does that mean? What's an anti-anthropological point of view? Anthropocentric. Yeah. So that basically means that I try to, in my projects, try to um, not put my own human uh, perspective central, uh, or to negotiate that relationship between me as a human and the organism, for instance, that I'm using in my work or the landscape. So for instance, I see glaciers also as beings. So they're kind of living beings, maybe not in, a, in the sense that a body is living, but they're still living beings. And I try to um, so see the world from their perspective. Yeah, that sounds very silly perhaps, but uh, I think this kind of far-fetched empathy is also needed to understand the changes that we're going through. And you, your work mostly deals with um, with minimal minerals and rocks and, and glaciers. You did show a project that involved algae, but what about the animals? You don't um, do, do you? Obviously, the animals are the, can suffer, whereas a glacier, I don't think can suffer. You you might think that because it's a <laughs> being, but um, why do you steer away from the kind of cuteness of animals or the the grief of of the death of species? Yeah, I'm not necessarily um, uh, steering away from that. Perhaps it will still come. And it's also you can see in my in in the chronological order of the works also that the you know I've I've been through the work I've been studying a lot. So first I've been very uh, very much studying the the nature culture divide. So here in the West, of course, we we make this clear distinction between nature and humans, whereas in other parts of the world, that's already seen as something that's completely intertwined or interconnected. And I think slowly but surely we're also coming back to that idea now here in the West. Um, and, but that was all about, you know, how, what is my relationship to, to the landscape or to the organisms that are living there? And it's now starting to move much more towards also this activist attitude. Um, and the project about glaciers came from um, actually my, my grief over uh, mass extinction, well, I don't know if it was extinction, but mass uh, starvation that happened during the red tide in Florida. Uh, which is basically this event where a huge algae bloom comes and then kills off everything that lives in that water. And it happened there because of the runoff of the plantations that were there. Um, so that really gave me that intense feeling of ecological grief. 
Um, and I'm actually starting to research now. I mean, maybe it's not in an animal sense, but I, I do really uh, research bacteria and algae and all those kind of uh, microbiological worlds. Um, but yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I think maybe in the future I will come out. It's not that I avoid it or anything. It just hasn't happened yet. We we'll look forward to the whale project. <laughs> yeah, perhaps I'll warn you when it, go, when it gets there. But you mentioned Ninka, I can never get her surname right, Ninka Hoflid. Hoflid, yeah. <laughs> um, and there are, there are a few designers like you and Ninka, mostly in the Netherlands, who are doing this kind of work. I mean, is this a, a kind of becoming a movement, do you think? Is there, are there, are there more people coming to you um, wanting to, to be sort of inspired by your methodologies and to do the same similar kind of work? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's good because we need so many more people who are addressing these topics. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned before that I was uh, leading this new master's program, Ecology Futures. Uh, so basically, that's all about um, yeah, training the new generation on these methodologies, on these alternative, like these new technologies, these new ways of visualizing these things, un untangling these complexities also through theory, because there's a lot of uh, eco philosophy uh, being written now. Uh, that's very useful to us artists because it's so close, you know, artists and humanities are so close. Um, and uh, even with Dutch and Virtuals, they just launched uh, Dutch and Virtuals Academy, uh, which offers, um, because I, much of my career I also, of course, owe to, to Dutch and Virtuals. I've, I've done a lot of projects with them. Um, and, you know, the, the way that they collaborate with each other and discuss this one theme, and you get all these different perspectives on this one theme, I think is very interesting. Uh, so they're also bringing, in, bringing this now into an uh, educational program. Uh, and I think that's, I mean, I'm, I'm very excited about that. It's been my major uh, job for the, for the past year to, to see how we can trace, translate this into ed education and uh, get as many, you know, talented artists and designers trained in these types of methodologies and, and addressing these kind of topics. And also, uh, in some of the previous talks we've done, designers have been talking, again, Dutch designers, you're, you're <laughs> working, talking about working with um, scientists more. So design schools working with um, science institutions, designers working with scientists. It was really great that we had the geologists on the talk that we did together at Dutch Design Week. Is that something that you can see more of happening? And, and how it's very easy for people to stay in their little bubbles, like the design world bubble. You go to a design fair and it's just designers. How can we increase the chances of these people coming together and, and collaborate? Yeah, so with this program, it's actually already embedded. So we also opened up not only to artists, but also to scientists or, uh, you know, we had a primatologist in the program. We invite them also, the lecturers, onto the program. And my PhD is now situated between the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Environmental Sciences. So for the next uh, three, four years, I'll be, you know, fully researching this relationship. How can you... Uh, bring these two fields together because it's extremely important and uh, most of the scientists that I speak to they're very willing to collaborate also but the problem usually is is that there's no budget or time to 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 work with an artist so there's a bit of an acknowledgement problem how yeah how the role of an artist or designer can help in you know um, conveying these topics and then not in a like a, here's my here's my paper promoted way but like in an actual profound where the knowledge is also being developed in the, from the art and design field, you know, that the art, the design work or the artwork itself can also be knowledge or the research that's being done. So you talked about the course you're going to do, but what are you going to do next in terms of projects? What's your next big thing that you're going to work on? So I've been to Chile last year um, on an artist in residency, and I've been uh, fully diving into that local context there. Uh, so, as I said, the PhD is practice-led, so that means that basically I will be developing new projects over the coming, uh, coming three, four years. Uh, but um, the landscape there dives further into, there's lots of um, uh, mega dams installed there that have a really huge impact on, on the environment. And I'm actually researching what arises from that types of environment, so that will be also central to the PhD. It's like, yeah, okay, we created this mess. Uh, but it's not all bad, you know, and it's not necessarily good for us humans, but there's new ecology that arises from it. So what does that ecology look like and how, you know, what does that ecology have, have to say? And I don't have any idea how, it, how that will look as a project in the future, but um, I've took samples with me and things and uh, we're researching it in the lab. So uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's definitely new things coming. 
Well, good luck with that. And Belfast isn't so far away from London, so I hope to get to see you, West York. That would be nice. Great to speak to you, Cassandra. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to speak with you as well. Thank you for having me. Great to finally figure out how to pronounce your name. Thanks so much. Speak soon. Bye. Bye.